Angel Michael faces Satan. Number one, Angel Michael defends the body of Moses. In the Bible, Michael is one of the most widely recognized angelic figures, alongside Gabriel. As an archangel, he holds a significant role in God's heavenly host. His duties and accomplishments are often discussed and debated among scholars and believers alike. Despite his importance, there is much mystery surrounding Michael and his place in the divine hierarchy. What has he accomplished? What are his duties? And how does he fit into God's heavenly host? The name Michael is derived from the Hebrew language, and it means, who is comparable to God? However, many parents, irrespective of their religious beliefs, choose to name their sons Michael without fully understanding the significance of the name. Michael is introduced to us by the prophet Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, verse 3. However, the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Whenever we observe Michael, we can't help but notice his involvement in some form of spiritual battle. Given his consistent connection with such struggles, it may be fitting to bestow upon him the title of general. The biblical phrase, one of the chief princes, suggests that Michael, the archangel, has other angelic counterparts. Nevertheless, the Bible remains silent regarding the identities of any other archangels besides Michael. Jude verse 9 refers to an event that is found nowhere else in Scripture. Michael had to struggle or dispute with Satan about the body of Moses, but what that entailed is not described. The ninth verse of the book of Jude details a fascinating and peculiar event that appears nowhere else in the Bible. According to the verse, the archangel Michael engaged in a dispute or struggle with the devil over the body of Moses. People have pondered on the nature of this conflict and what it signifies. Jude 9. But Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him an abusive judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Michael is the only one the Bible calls an archangel. In Jude 9, we learn Michael's title, Archangel, Archegelos, is a Greek word that means chief angel or chief messenger. It is natural to question the origin of this information. One may wonder how Jude acquired such knowledge. Some speculate that it was obtained through the passing down of traditions. There is no clear understanding as to why Michael and Satan had a disagreement regarding the body of Moses. It is speculated that Satan may have desired to locate the exact location of the body in order to construct a shrine. Israel's people would turn to idolatrous worship of Moses' bones. Michael, the angelic representative, would protect them from this sin by keeping the burial site secret. Moses had died in a unique circumstance. The mere mention of the name Moses arouses different images in the minds of various folks. The death of Moses is shrouded in some mystery in the Bible. According to historical records, Moses passed away at the remarkable age of 120 years old. What is truly astounding is that, despite his advanced age, he remained physically and mentally strong until the very end. His eyesight remained keen and his physical strength never faded, as if age had no power over him. It is clear that Moses was a special individual. Satan and Angel Michael were likely outside the Promised Land on Mountain Pisgah. According to the biblical account, Moses was not allowed to enter the Promised Land due to his disobedience as the waters of Meribah Kadesh. Despite leading the Israelites to the very threshold of Canaan, he was only afforded a mere glimpse of the land and was not permitted to set foot on it. Towards the end of his life, God granted Moses the opportunity to witness the land he had left Egypt for. To do so, he ascended Mount Nebo, which towers over the plains of Moab and reached the top of Pisgah, from where he was able to behold the land in all its splendor. At an elevation of 4,500 feet, the summit of Mount Pisgah towers above its surroundings like a mighty colossus. It's hard to fathom the sheer scale of this natural wonder, which looms almost a full mile above the landscape. 
One can only imagine the physical and mental fortitude it takes to climb to the top of this mountain, especially for those who have reached the ripe old age of 120. It's a feat that demands respect and admiration from anyone who hears the tale of such a courageous accomplishment. There was no trail wide enough for Moses, and he didn't need one anyway. If you're wondering what condition he was in, that feat will tell you. He knew he would pass away since God had told him so, and the Lord had already set another man, Joshua, in his stead before he died. And that was it. God wanted him home. Moses gave up the spirit. Moses is the only person in the Bible whom God personally buried. Did you realize that? The Lord then hid the tomb. This is where we meet Angel Michael and Satan. But the important point is this. Even if Michael is an archangel, an elect one, despite his elevated status, Michael did not engage in disrespectful or reproachful behavior towards the ruler of the demonic realm. Rather, he entrusted all forms of rebuking to God, acknowledging the Almighty's ultimate power and authority over all things. Most angels in the Bible are described as messengers, whereas Michael is represented in all three books as contending, resisting, or standing against evil spirits and principalities. The language of this rebuke matches Zechariah chapter 3, verse 2, where the Lord rebukes Satan for his accusations against Joshua, the high priest. Zechariah chapter 3, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Despite his great power, Michael remains completely submissive to the Lord. The righteous angels have a rank and are submissive to authority. Considering Michael's strength, the archangel's submission to God is all the more beautiful. We can see that submission is never meant to take away an individual's strength, purpose, or value. Even Michael the archangel did not fight the enemy on his own authority, but spoke in the Lord's name. Michael regarded his office and position with reverence. Lucifer had been created as the highest creature. This is a lesson that both you and I must learn. Many Christians have yet to learn to bow even to God. You and I, my friend, are creatures. He is the Creator. What gives you and I the right to question anything He does? Don't get me wrong, we all struggle with doubts. But we must acknowledge that God is not only the Creator, but also the Redeemer. He is the one who cares for us, but our God is exalted, holy, and exalted. He is a righteous and just God. He never makes a blunder, and He never makes a mistake. Everything He does is correct, so you and I can trust Him. But do we actually do that? Do we acknowledge His authority? Do we value His person? When men are called to account, the Lord Jesus Christ will say, You said, Lord, Lord, but you did not do what I commanded. Each went his or her own way and did what was right in his or her own eyes. This is the image of humanity. So, how about you? How am I doing today? Michael the Archangel is an example for us. In this particular conflict, there was a third individual involved who was none other than Satan himself. A personality referred to as Lucifer appears in Isaiah 14. The Latin root of the name Lucifer means one who brings light, while in Hebrew it translates to morning star. Lucifer was portrayed as a radiant, splendid, and majestic being in every language. He was one of the highest ranking angels in God's heavenly hosts, along with Michael and Gabriel. However, at some point, Lucifer made a grave mistake. He challenged God. Luke chapter 10, verse 18. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. During one of his teachings to his disciples, Jesus shared a vivid description of a scene he had personally experienced in heaven. This event took place before he was born as the son of Mary. He used this encounter to caution his followers about the dangers of allowing pride to control their actions and decisions. The scene he described was God's judgment on a created angel named Lucifer. This angel was created by God and had once held a position of great distinction and honor in heaven. However, due to his own pride and rebellion, 
he had fallen from grace and incurred the wrath of the Almighty. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 through 15. Son of man, take up a song of mourning over the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the Lord God says. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the ruby, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the lapis lazuli, the turquoise, and the emerald, and the gold, the workmanship of your settings and socket, was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. Lucifer is described as the anointed cherub who covers. The cherubim spread their wings atop, enveloping the mercy seat with their wings. They faced each other. The faces of the cherubim were towards the mercy seat. Lucifer was exemplary in beauty. Pride caused him to challenge God and to seek a place of equality with God. Apparently, Lucifer had authority over a company of angels, and he had succeeded in alienating some of those under him from their loyalty to God. He led them to join him in his rebellion against God's authority. As a result, God expelled Lucifer and his followers from his divine presence. The story highlights Lucifer's cunning and persistent efforts to turn angels away from God and his ultimate downfall due to his arrogance and disobedience. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 16 through 19. Through the abundance of your commerce, you are internally filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you out as a profane and unholy thing from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub. From the midst of the stones of fire, your heart was proud and arrogant because of your beauty. You destroyed your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings that they might look at you. You profaned your sanctuaries. By the great quantity of your sins and the enormity of your guilt, by the unrighteousness of your trade, therefore I have brought forth a fire from your midst. It has consumed you, and I have reduced you to ashes on the earth. In the sight of all who look at you, all the peoples, nations who knew you, are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible and terrifying end and will forever cease to be. Within certain versions of the Bible, the term trading is used to describe an individual who engages in spreading rumors or gossip, also referred to as a talebearer or a slanderer. This word appears in several other books of the Bible, such as Leviticus, Proverbs, and Jeremiah. In essence, this person is like a merchant, peddling both goods and damaging information about others, which can cause harm and discord. It's important to recognize the negative impact of such behavior and strive to avoid engaging in it ourselves. Apparently, this illustrates exactly what Lucifer did. He went among the created angelic beings and promoted an organized rebellion against God. The devil has never had to change his tactics, either in heaven or on earth, for one simple reason, because they still work. All this did not happen suddenly or even in a few days. We have no way of measuring the time it took Lucifer to promote his rebellion, but it was long enough for him to organize a carefully planned revolt against God and to convince an estimated one-third of the angels to join him. Lucifer's heart was lifted up in pride because of his beauty, and this was the reason that he was cast out of the mountain of God. I believe it is vital for all of us to realize that the first sin in the universe was not murder, nor adultery, but rather pride. It was pride that produced rebellion. Furthermore, it was pride arising from the blessings of which God himself was the author. God gave Lucifer his power, authority, beauty, and wisdom. All those were gifts from God. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 11 through 15. Your pride and the music of your harps have been brought down to Sheol. Maggots are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are your covering. How you have fallen from heaven, you star of the morning, son of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of assembly. 
In the recesses of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Nevertheless, you will be brought down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. We do not know why Moses wanted the body of Moses, but whatever his plans were, we know that they were for evil. Even his demons, which cast out of the demon-possessed man, caused all the pigs to go to their end. The more we know about an opponent's strategy, the better we can prepare our defenses and thus remain unmoved. In the Bible, there are numerous examples of Satan's strategies. He steals, kills, and destroys. While these strategies do not appear to be subtle, Satan can make even stealing, killing, and destroying appear to be subtle. Now Michael, according to this account, stands up in defense of Moses, and in the zeal of an upright and bold spirit, says to Satan, the Lord rebuke thee. Number two, the war on heaven. Michael faces the dragon and his fallen angels. John reveals the battle between Satan and angel Michael in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation stands out from other books of the New Testament because of its unique message. It not only addresses the church of the first century to whom it was originally written, but it also has a message for the church across various ages, especially for those living during the end times who will witness the second coming of Christ. The Apostle John wrote a unique book, which is one of the few he contributed to the New Testament. This was his last book, written just before he passed away. The book of Revelation speaks about a war. For any team to win, there must be a contest. Revelation 12 describes the ultimate battle between good and evil. The hosts of heaven take on the dragon and his angels. Does good eventually win? Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 8. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they did not prevail, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. War broke out in heaven. God will turn the tide against Satan at the midpoint of the Great Tribulation, first in heaven, then on earth. Satan will be denied access to heaven as a result of a battle. While Satan is likely headed to hell, he is not presently there. It's common to see cartoons depicting Satan in a red outfit with a pitchfork and pointed tail. But such medieval folklore is hardly faithful to the biblical picture. In Job 1, Satan is mentioned as having access to heaven and visiting God's presence there. This brings us to Revelation chapter 12, where the devil and his imps march on heaven, creating a cosmic spiritual conflict. As the dragon fought, he did not prevail. The Archangel Michael was God's champion and commanding general of God's forces. How is this battle fought? We know this is a real fight, but is it a material or spiritual battle? Our battle with Satan and his demons is spiritual, fought on the battleground of truth and deception, of fear and faith. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Regarding material attacks against the believer, Satan and his demons were disarmed at the cross. In this classic work, Paradise Lost, the great poet Milton imagined this battle. Michael bid sound, the archangel trumpet, through the vast of heaven, sounded, and the faithful armies run Hosanna to the highest, nor stood at gaze the adverse legions, nor less hideous, joined the horrid shock. Now storming fury rose, the clamor such as heard in heaven till now was never, arms on armor clashing braid. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Immediately following Satan's defeat and prior to his war against the church, a loud voice in heaven proclaims God and his people's victory over Satan the accuser. In verse 9, the dragon is identified as Satan, but in verse 10, he is described as the accuser who brings charges against God's people. Satan refers to his identity, but accuser refers to his role in God's war against his people. Since believers triumphed over Satan, 
They are confident of victory even though Satan continually accuses them. Their victory over Satan was based on three factors. The blood of the Lamb, their faithful testimony to Jesus, their faithfulness to Christ. A faithful testimony to Christ brings them victory in the spiritual war. We read, So the great dragon was cast out. Throughout this verse, our spiritual enemy is referred to as dragon, the serpent of old, the devil, Satan, and the one who deceives the whole world. These titles describe Satan as vicious, an accuser, an adversary, and a deceiver. We read, He was cast to the earth. The Bible describes various falls of Satan, and Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 describes the second of these four falls. Satan went from having access to heaven to restriction to the earth. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 21. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. Satan also went from the earth to bondage in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the keys of the abyss in a great chain in his hand. And he took hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. We read, The accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Satan's accusing work ends here, when he is cast out from his access to heaven. That is why today we need an intercessor and advocate. We read, And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. This tells us three keys to the saint's victory over Satan. Satan may have deceived even himself into thinking that he has a chance. Our rebellion against God makes even less sense than Satan's rebellion does. The heavens can rejoice over the dragon's departure, but it is bad news for the earth and the sea. The devil knows his time is short, and he is determined to pour out his wrath as widely as possible. The dragon's spleen is vented especially against Israel, the nation from which the Messiah came. Satan's being hurled to the earth ends his position of privilege in God's court. Ironically, Satan's loss of place contrasts starkly with the place of refuge God provides his own people persecuted by Satan. Satan's defeat in heaven does not mean an end to physical suffering on earth. The saints here continue to overcome the devil as they overcome the world by faithfully testifying of Christ's victory even to the point of death. The primary way Satan attacks the people of God is through blasphemy, and he is the accuser of our brethren. Even so, believers have a divine advocate before God named Jesus Christ. Satan, the adversary, may seek to destroy God's people, but Jesus Christ is the Good Shepherd. There are many lessons here. The truth? First, victory only comes with a fight. Every crown comes at a cost. There is no success without sacrifice. The good news is anything worth achieving is worth the fight. Michael didn't fight alone, and the saints didn't defeat the enemy alone. God designed us to win in community. A victory should always be celebrated. The heavens rejoice when the Lamb wins. The greater the victory, the greater the celebration. Michael, the archangel, will shout as he accompanies Jesus at his second coming. Not only does he proclaim the matchless and exciting news that Jesus Christ returns, but he speaks the word of life to all who are dead in Christ and who await the resurrection. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. As Michael fought on Daniel's behalf against demons in the Old Testament era, angels fight for believers today and will fight for Israel in the tribulation to come. Heaven is too small for two objects of worship, and it is written in Jude 1 that the angels who did not keep their first estate, number one, were cast down. The lesson of Lucifer's fall. Number one, when you refuse to worship, you get down, you go down. If you want to be a down Christian, be too proud to worship. Number two, pride is a fast way down. The devil was once the bright morning star, a lovely angelic being who fell from the heavens. He rebelled against God, becoming Satan, God's ultimate foe. What you don't turn into praise becomes pride. The higher we rise, the more we're supposed to give God the glory. 
the glory to God, the honor to God, and the more God blesses you, you're not supposed to become more arrogant. Look at me, I don't have to worship like those lowly people. You were nothing at the time, but God picked you up and blessed you. According to the Bible, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In the book of Genesis, God breathed on mankind. Be a worshiper. If you've got the life of God in you, then praise the Lord. That is the commandment of the scriptures. We were justified to glorify. We were liberated to love Him. You've been redeemed to rejoice. You've been delivered to dance. You've been set free to sing. Be humble and praise God. Praise is a serious topic in the Bible. However, there are those who make light of it and make fun of it, even in the church. The only thing that can keep you in a spiritual environment, and I emphasize this, is to praise and worship God. The day you decide not to worship God, you leave His presence. A fish cannot survive without water. The human body cannot survive without oxygen. And a Christian cannot survive without praising and worshiping God. You'll have to thank God sooner or later. You'll have to learn to clap your hands and say hallelujah sooner or later. Praise be to God. Thank you a lot, Jesus. I adore you, Lord. Praise be to God. In any case, sooner or later, if you do not, you will not be in God's presence, and you will perish if you do not spend time in God's presence. This is not the only moment recorded that an angel stood to oppose the forces of evil. This angel, named Gabriel, in Daniel chapter 8, verse 16, tells Daniel that he was resisted by a demon called the Prince of Persia until the archangel Michael came to his assistance. So we learn from Daniel that angels and demons fight spiritual battles over the souls of men and nations, and that the demons resist angels and try to prevent them from doing God's bidding. Let us pray. Almighty Father, I come before you today with a heart full of humility, seeking your divine protection from the evil that surrounds us. We live in a world where we are constantly bombarded with images of sin and temptation through various mediums such as television, the internet, books, and newspapers. These images leave us vulnerable to the wiles of the devil, and we need your divine intervention to shield us from them. I pray that you will surround us with your divine hedge of protection and fill us with your strength and might. May your grace and mercy be upon us, and may we find joy and solace in your loving arms. May all who seek refuge in you find gladness and sing praises to your name. Father, I ask that you shelter us in your loving embrace so that those who love you may exult in your blessings. May we feel your favor as a shield, protecting us from all harm and danger. We trust in your promises and believe that you will bless the righteous and surround them with your favor. In your holy name we pray, amen. Dear Lord, I humbly request for your divine protection over our minds. As it is written in your word, the mindset that is focused on the flesh leads to death, but the mindset that is focused on the spirit leads to life and peace. Therefore, I implore you, O God, to help us set our minds on you. Let us not be influenced by the ways of this world, but rather, let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may be able to discern and prove what your will is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. May our thoughts and actions always align with your divine purpose for our lives. Amen. As I embrace the beginning of this new day, I approach it with a sense of humility, recognizing that I am under the loving care of a higher power. I ask for your divine protection and guidance as I navigate through the twists and turns that this day may bring. May your shielding presence surround me, and may your grace be my armor as I face the challenges that lie ahead. I humbly ask that you guide my steps, leading me along paths of righteousness. Protect my mind from the negative thoughts and emotions that may try to cloud my judgment. As I interact with others throughout the day, I pray that I may be a beacon of your love and peace, radiating your goodness through my words and actions. I entrust my loved ones into your hands, knowing that your watchful eyes are upon them too. As the shepherd watches over his flock, watch over us as well, protecting us from harm and leading us away from the snares of the enemy. In Jesus' name, I pray for your continued guidance and protection throughout the day. Amen.